My name's Matt Ridley. Uh, I'm a Conservative backbencher in the House of Lords, and I'm also a columnist on The Times. Uh, and I'm uh, fortunate enough to introduce the first female president of the uh, National Farmers Union, Minette Batters. Uh, but before I do so, I'm going to take 10 minutes of your time just to give a global overview of food and f food production uh, and really remind us, perhaps, that most of the countryside is used for food production. This wasn't the way in the Middle Ages. Most of the countryside was used for producing fiber and fuel and shelter and all these other things, but most of those are now made in factories. Food is the one thing we still have to make in the landscape, mainly. Um, and talking of the Middle Ages, I was looking up some data the other day. Battle Abbey in Sussex uh, was a monastery that had a farm, and it kept good records, and you can work out the yields of its farm uh, in the 1370s. Uh, and in a good year, they got four grains of barley for every grain they sowed. In a bad year, they got two. In a medium year, they got three. And one of those grains had to be kept back for the next harvest. That's how marginal farming was for most of the history. Today, on my farm in Northumberland, I would expect 100 grains of wheat for every grain that gets sowed uh, at an average yield. That's the measure of the transformation of agriculture that has happened over the centuries. And the vast majority of that transformation has happened since the Second World War. Uh, British wheat yields roughly quadrupled in the years, uh, in the 50 years after 1945. In the 19th century, we fed a growing population of the world by taking more land under the plough and the cow uh, and not increasing yields barely at all. Uh, we cultivated the prairies, the pampas, the steppes and the outback for the first time. In the 20th century, by contrast, we took very little new land under the plough and the cow. Uh, instead, we improved the yield from the land that we had. And we did that really in four ways. Through mechanization, the tractor replacing the horse released 25% of land that had previously been growing food for horses. Uh, the, uh, we used fertilizer, we, made, we turned the air into nitrate so that uh, it could be used to uh, improve the yields of crops through the Haber-Bosch process. And 50% of the nitrogen atoms in my body as I stand here today have traveled here via a pneumonia factory from the air, uh, rather than through a legume, for example, to give you an idea of how important that revolution was. Uh, and we used chemicals to uh, combat the uh, competitors for our crops, the pests, diseases, and weeds. Uh, and finally, and more importantly, of course, we use genetics. We dramatically improved the genetics of all our varieties, initially with hybridization and traditional breeding, then with mutagenesis under x-rays and things like that, uh, all uncontroversially. And then suddenly we started doing it more precisely through genetic engineering and everyone got upset uh, for reasons I don't fully understand. Um, and in the process, we virtually banished famine. And we shouldn't forget that, what an incredible achievement that was. If you go back to the 1960s and 70s, everybody is forecasting that famine will get worse, will get commoner at the beginning of the 21st century. And it didn't happen. In fact, today there is virtually no famine anywhere in the world. There's the occasional famine, but it's usually caused by politics, not by shortages. It's caused by uh, a dictator like Kim Jong-un uh, or a war in South Sudan or somewhere like that. Um, and indeed, if you look at real food prices averaged over a basket of crops uh, over the last century, they've come down in real terms at the rate of about 1% per year. And there's every sign that that's going to continue. So high food prices are not going to come to the rescue of British farmers, Minette, I think. You may contradict me on that. Um, and uh, this process of dramatically improving the amount of food we can get out of uh, out of the land, has, we should remember, been good for the environment in many ways, because it has basically spared land. We use 68% less land today to produce a given quantity of food compared with what we did uh, in 1960. That's, me, that means that if we were trying to uh, feed today's population of 7 billion people uh, with the t agricultural techniques of 1960, we would need to cultivate 82% of the world's surface land area instead of the 34% that we do farm, cultivate and graze, I should say. Um, that's in a measure of just how much land has been spared, how much rainforest has been saved and wetland has been saved by the improvements uh, in agricultural yields, and we shouldn't forget that. And on a more local scale, too, as we've heard today, 
uh, um, technological improvements are often not in conflict with environmental uh, uh, aims. So, for example, the no-till farming uh, revolution, which Michael Gove and others uh, talked about, um, is made possible effectively by cheap herbicides like glyphosate as an alternative to ploughing. And you may think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is uh, undoubtedly the case that no-till farming would not have advanced nearly as far without herbicides. Uh, and the obvious case of this is genetically modified organisms, where uh, 20 years ago, Europe decided to turn its back on this technology, the rest of the world did not, and the results of that experiment are in. Not only are yields 22% up on average across all genetically modified crops compared with their non-genetically modified varieties, but pesticide use is 37% down. That's from a meta-analysis by Göttingen University. Uh, and in fact, there was a paper published this week uh, by the University of Maryland showing that there's a halo effect from genetically modified crops. In other words, insect-resistant uh, sweet corn and peppers in New Jersey uh, not only protect themselves, but they protect their neighbors by not spreading pests onto them and by being resistant to diseases without being sprayed. And so they actually have uh, biological predators uh, um, of pests in them. Uh, and so there's an 80% reduction in pesticide use in neighboring farms next to genetically modified organisms. So I think environmentally it was a huge mistake to sit out that revolution in Europe. But we now have a revolution coming along in genetics that is much more uh, powerful in many ways, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing revolution, which is, going to, which is enabling us to do precise gene edits, edits to plants and animals, uh, and which uh, promises to uh, uh, allow great precision without any of the risks of transgenics that people were worried about. Already Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Canada, Sweden, uh, have, uh, and the United States have said that they will regulate gene-edited crops in the same way as conventionally bred varieties. And this is crucial to uh, allowing regulatory uh, certainty for people developing these crops. Um, the Advocate General of the European Court of Justice has said he agrees with this, and he thinks that there is no reason to, uh, to distinguish between gene-edited crops and conventionally bred varieties because they are literally indistinguishable. One takes seven years to produce, the other seven months, but that's the only difference. Um, however, and so I think that the British government should send out a strong signal by saying it wishes to do the same thing. But that's not the only revolution. We've heard this morning about precision agriculture, robotics, drones. Uh, we've heard about hydroponics uh, and the possibility of indoor farming on a large scale. There is a factory in Japan producing 30,000 lettuce heads a day. Uh, in, in a soil-free system with no pesticides because it's a sterile environment uh, and with lower energy use than farming because although they lead electricity through LED lights to provide the light, uh, they don't have uh, anything like as much tractor fuel to use. Uh, these are technologies that are going to make a, a big difference and they all have the effect, as I say, of land sparing. And that is a tremendously important environmental gain. I think in the UK we probably have four options, roughly speaking, going forward post-Brexit. Uh, one is to go for self-sufficiency in case the U-boats come back uh, and subsidize farming to the point where we can grow enough food to feed everybody and use every acre that we've got. I don't think that's realistic politically or economically. Uh, the other is to give up farming altogether in the UK, import all our food and turn Britain into a national park, um, which again I don't think is a starter. Uh, but it's the other extreme from that. In between those two, I think we have two choices. One is to do land sharing, where we farm dirtily, if you like, so that there are weeds and but butterflies in the crops. Um, and the other is to do land sparing, where we farm as efficiently as we can so as to be economically self-sufficient, so as to uh, make sure that farming doesn't need so uh, too much in the way of subsidy. Um, but to, as a quid pro quo to say to farmers, if you are going to be highly productive, you must also set aside land for nature. And you must cultivate and manage that for biodiversity as actively as you manage uh, the rest of your land. As you can see, that's the sustainable intensification route that I think the UK should go down. It could be that Minette is going to agree, disagree fervently with me, and I hope she does, because that'll make a good conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn, turn you over to Minette Batters, the president of the NFU and a uh, mixed beef 
uh, dairy, uh, beef, sheep, and wheat farmer from Wiltshire.